I'm a bit confused because a whistleblower wrote to me only last week, once we'd advertised that this session was happening, to tell me that you do, in fact, prioritise <coughs> parcels over letters. And in fact, he sent me a picture of a poster that's on his rack in one of your offices. And I'll just read, read you what it, what it says here. This is from last week, where it says, the future is parcels. Unless your manager directs you otherwise, these are your priorities on delivery each day. Number one, premium items and collections. Number two, large parcels. Number three, lapsing, including all parcels. And number four, at least half of the delivery points on your frame, including letters. So letters are, are ranked number four in the priority list, and only half of them. So you're unilaterally only delivering on 50% of your USO, aren't you, Mr Thompson? I'm actually aware of that particular correspondence which was done in one delivery office and it was dealt with and it was a local action. But this isn't with. true. Who wrote this poster, Mr Thompson? That is absolutely not our policy. Well, it's, it's on a Royal Mail poster that your workers are being asked to read when they go to work. If that's not Royal Mail policy, how else do you communicate Royal Mail policy? That is, not our, that is absolutely not our policy. Mm. I'd remind you, Mr Thompson, that misleading Parliament is not something that we appreciate here on the committee. And I think if this is not the case, you're going to need to write to us with sufficient details afterwards to prove that that's changed. Why do you think your predecessor has criticised you in public for not having enough experience in mishandling this situation? Do you know, I really believe in Royal Mail, I believe in the brand, I believe in the opportunity to grow the business. I think we've got an absolutely wonderful opportunity ahead of us. I think when the board made the appointment for me, it was around understanding the customer, understanding the digitisation of the business um, and getting the changes that we need to win. And I was listening to the debate just before, and I think it's important just to home in on the changes that we need. You know, what I am doing and what the team are doing around me is making sure that we can compete in the parcels market. I think that the reality that we face is that letters were 20 billion letters a year. We did back in 2003, 2004. They're now around about 8 billion. So our, our core business, as we had before, is we used to deliver two, you know, two letters per day per household. We're now down to around about one letter per day for every other household. That business has really gone in massive decline, and during that period of time as well, the number of houses that we've delivered to has increased by around about 4 million, from around about 31 million to 4 million. So the reality is we are going to 10% more places, and yet our business is down 60%. So what I'm focused on and what the business is focused on now is growing in that parcels market. We've spent £900 million investing in to be able to compete in the parcels market. You know, we've got our great super hubs, we've increased our automation, we've made some great progress. But what we really need now is the change in the working practices so we can turn that investment into competing in, as has been said here at the committee, a hyper-competitive market. Thank you. Um, you didn't answer my question. My question was, why do you think your predecessor criticised you in public for not having enough experience and not handling this situation well? Well, I think during this dispute, there's an awful lot of things have been said that have been very personal. I think that it's not uh, necessary. I don't think it's nice. Um, and it doesn't change the fact that what we need to do is change the business and compete in the parcels market. And that's what myself and my team are definitely focused on. Just now, you said to the committee that you were appointed as CEO because you understand your customers and digital solutions. You didn't say workers. Do you understand your workers, Mr Thompson? Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that I've really dedicated my time to as I've been the CEO has been out and about actually with the workforce. Um, you know, I, I'm out and about on a frequent basis, generally absolutely every week. I also put in place Workplace as well, which I know was referenced earlier on. We have around about 50,000 of our team on Workplace, and it's great that they've now got a voice. And what we put on that platform is real key information about the changes that we need. And it's always good to get their reaction. Now, of course, I understand that I will always explain the changes that we need. I understand that that is not always welcome, but I think it's really important that we have an open dialogue with the workforce. Why were you given a bonus of £140,000 last year? You know, the bonus that was paid to me last year was based on the business performance last year and based on the criteria that were set uh, by the remuneration committee at that point in time. When I looked at the long-term investment plan uh, parameters for the calculation of your bonus, I'd noted that the board had changed the way they measure your performance. So traditionally, it would be looking at revenue, profit, service level delivery. I understand it's been changed to just shareholder value. 
Is that why you dished out so many millions of pounds last year instead of investing it into the business? Because it creates the opportunity for you to get a larger bonus? No, not at all. In fairness, my bonuses are based on improving the business constitution, changing the revenue, growing the profitability, and also improving in areas such as CO2. But, you know, I'll come back to what I, I just, said. Can I just check? Because if I've misunderstood, then I'll, I'll apologise. But I'd read that for 2022-23, the long-term investment uh, programme for bonuses for you and your colleagues on the board had been changed because, according to the organisation, it couldn't accurately measure your performance on revenue and profits because of the state of affairs at Royal Mail, and therefore it only looked at shareholder value. Is that not right? No, my, my incentives are based on making sure that we deliver good quality to the customer and also make sure that we grow the business. And so there wasn't that change? No, there was that change, and I understand the point you're making. But in terms of what I focus on every day, what I'm focused on every day is making sure that we can give the best jobs in town and the long-term job security for the team. And we really do need that change. And, and it's not change that I'm doing for change's sake. It's change based on the changing needs of the customers and the reality that's around us. The point I'm trying to get to is that you are incentivized as the CEO of Royal Mail purely by delivering value for shareholders. It doesn't really decide, depend on how you get that. I mean, ideally, you would get shareholder value because you run a profitable, happy, successful business. But actually, if you cut costs, cut investments, cut the workforce, and still deliver a large dividend, you still do well out of that, don't you? No, what I'm focused on, as I said before, is changing the business so we can compete in the parcels market. And we've invested that £900 million. Pounds. I'm pleased to say that... You know, our super hub in Warrington has come on stream and that is working very well. The other investments we're making in the Midlands with the super hub is also coming on well. We've grown our parcels automation from some 20 odd percent. Uh, it's now up to over 70 percent. What we need is the ways of working so that we can really compete in the market. And I'd also like to add as well that during my time here as CEO, we've really led the initiative around low CO2 for parcel, the next battleground. Uh, that is out there and I'm, it's great to, to be able to report that because of our feet on the street model and our invest, investment in electric vehicles that we're really leading um, in this initiative and that's something that'll be good for the future of the business as well as society. Well, I congratulate you on that but if you don't have any workers Mr Thompson I'm not sure it's all going to go very well. Um, in terms of your transformation plan which external advisors are advising you on the transformation of Royal Mail? Um, we do have a number of advisors, but I, when I came in from, uh, from a CEO's perspective, I've changed an awful lot of the executive team. External of, advisors, Mr. Thompson. No, I understand. But one of the things... My questions, if you could answer it, please. Well, we do have some external advisors, like all large organisations such ones? as us. The point I would like to make is and that... My I, question is, which external advisors? I'm not asking you to make a different point. I'm asking you to answer my question. Well, we'd have an awful lot of external advisors that do advisors. A lot of those agreements are actually a confidential thing. I think that if... if Which advisors are advising you on the transformation of Royal Mail? If the committee would like some more information on that, then we'll would, That's why I'm asking you the question. What's the answer, please? We'd certainly write to you and give you that why information. Why can't you tell me now? Because some of those agreements that we have with the external organisations have an element of confidentiality, and I don't want to make mm. a mistake here and get that wrong, but we'll certainly write. And well, I'd, I'd encourage you. You're covered by parliamentary privilege, Mr Thompson, so no one can sue you. That's why you can give us honest answers. The reason I'm asking this question is because if you look at the wider industry, mm -hmm. a certain set of external consultants and advisors are advising all business businesses to invest in technology and automated devices in reducing headcount for workers uh, in using self-employed drivers and cutting costs and all of the things that we're seeing at Royal Mail and you might see that in Amazon or Every or other types of companies where this committee has heard testimony of working conditions being entirely unacceptable for those people you're just following a similar track aren't you because you're being advised by probably those same consultants. No, I don't agree with that. I don't think that's the case at all here. We're very, very proud that 97% of our team are actually full-time uh, employees. We're very proud of the fact that we give the best terms and conditions in town, and there are things that we are determined to maintain. What does PBA stand for, Mr Thompson? I, I don't know, actually. I apologise. I don't know what that stands for. I was told by one of your employees that, I don't know what PBA stands for, but it sounds similar to what Amazon uses, and they gave testimony to us about this a few weeks ago. Apparently, it's a bit of technology that tracks how quickly uh, your staff are processing packages and letters and getting them out the door, and that you're using technology to 
decide on the length of routes, the speed at which they should go. And I've been told by some of your workers that they're having to run from door to door because the technology is telling them they need to be quicker. Do you have that technology in place, Mr. Thompson? No, I'm not aware of technology that we have in place that tells people to work more quickly. I'm not aware of that at all. You've not used technology and automation to decide the size of routes? No, we do have a revisions exercise in place where we have a look at the volumes that are required in routes. And this is, this is normal standard business practice and something that we've done for absolutely many years to make sure that the workload for each individual route is actually equal between each of the team. And one thing that I see when I go out, and I get asked the question very often, is that why is it that some walks might be two hours long and some walks might also be four hours long? And what we do is a regular revision exercise to make sure that those walks are equal. And so you're telling the committee that your members of staff don't carry bits of technology, whatever that might be, that tracks how quickly they're doing their job? No, they do They do have a PDA, and that PDA does actually... Ah, it was a PDA, not a PVA. Ah. I, did I miss here on the phone when someone called me? So you do know what a PDA is, do you? Yes, I what do. What is that? Yeah, a PDA is a device that our workers will have, which actually helps them in terms of knowing where to go in their route and also might be scanning items at the doorstep. You are doing exactly the same as other employers, such as Amazon, and using technology in this way. No, well, we do use technologies, which is a normal course of our business that we do. But I, 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 the, the point that you're making about, you know, does this device tell people to go more quickly is not something that we do. But of course... Why are you tracking the speed at which employees are doing their work if you're not using that for any purpose? Well, what we do is, of course, from a customer's perspective, what a customer wants is something called an estimated delivery window. What we need to do with that technology is make sure, which is based on the needs of the customer, that the customer has an idea of the window when it is that that product is actually going to be arrived. But we do not use that technology in any form of way that when anyone re returns back to the office in some form of penal way. That is not what we do. Okay. I mean, Mr. Thompson, you're quite good at evading my questions. I mean, the points I wanted to make today was that your bonus package had been changed in order to just focus purely on shareholder value, that you're using external consultants to do what's happening in the rest of the industry, and you're using technology in a way that adds enormous amount of stress onto your workforce. I think the answers to all of those questions have in the long run been yes. Uh, and I would just politely suggest to you that when we've talked to other businesses doing that, it doesn't really go in the interests of the business, their customers. Um, it's not the best way uh, to go. Uh, so I'll ask you one more time, for all the criticism that's been levied at you for mishandling this situation in the state of affairs at Royal Mail, do you not have any humility to recognise that it's really not been going very well since you were appointed CEO? I think that clearly there are some things that have not, not gone as well as we would want it. I totally understand that. I think as a CEO of any business, there is we no one... There said is no, we want it. Isn't it your responsibility, Mr Well, Thompson? of course, I am accountable for the business. I don't think anyone would have wanted the disruption that we've had for our customers over the last uh, nine months. I think that's absolutely clear. Forgive me just for asking maybe a simple question, but when was the decision taken to separate the parcels, the international parcels business from the USO obligations? I'm not sure of the, the, the question, I'm sorry. I... Uh, from your evidence today, as I understand it, you've got a profitable kind of parcels business. You called it GLS, right? Ah, sorry. Um, and then you've got the, the letters business, the USA, which you've been trying to reduce your obligations under with the government. Uh, when was the decision taken to separate the two? Well, they've always been two separate organisations, uh, been separate for some time. Since privatisation? Um, yes, they, they have always been run as separate businesses. The GLS business has a chief executive and the Royal Mail has a chief executive, which is me. And so uh, I think you, what you've been saying is the GLS bit is profitable and viable, but I think you said earlier there are viability concerns about the Royal Mail bit. Yes, I think that's right. But what I would say, and we presented to the market back in November time, a turnaround plan for Royal Mail in the UK. It can be a, a very, very profitable and business that flourishes, but we just need the changes that are based on the customer's needs to make it that way. Okay. It just reminds me a bit of the buses, Mr. Thompson. When buses were privatised, the bus company CEOs say, oh, we've got a profitable route here, but we can't cross-subsidise to the routes over here that are not profitable. And so then you cut the routes that are not profitable, and then local communities, often low-income local communities, have no bus. And then the CEOs come to government and the taxpayer and say, oh, well, we can't cross-subsidise the profitable routes. We can take the profits, but we can't cross-subsidise. Can you give us some taxpayers' money to pay for the buses for people over here that need it? Uh, it feels like a very similar conversation. I think you're going to probably be wanting to ask the government for 
more money or a reduction in the USO or something to make the bit that you've described as being potentially unviable viable, aren't you? No, I don't think that's the case. I, I've been clear on our position on the USO from six days to five days on the basis of viability and customer need. That is something that we have absolutely asked for. Uh, but, but there is a great future for Royal Mail. The reason I took the job is that I absolutely believe in the business that it can compete and flourish in the market. You know, we do have some great advantages. Dave mentioned it earlier on, that we go everywhere. I think that's a massive advantage and we've got great infrastructure as well. We've also innovated in some really great services. You know, we are, we're uniquely positioned to implement parcel collect. You know, Dave talked about the fact that we want a bigger role for postal workers. I agree with him. You know, parcel collect, being able to pick something up at the doorstep instead of someone having to drive and park to hand over a parcel, I think is a magical thing and something that's uniquely ours. We've also appointed a managing director of Royal Mail Medical, so we are looking to build some new businesses as well uh, on the basis that we go everywhere and also the fact that we have that trusted relationship. Mr Thompson, if I might politely say so, I've not been very pleased with your answers today. I know this is a difficult job for you, but it's really important that you answer questions clearly uh, and, might I say, um, uh, uh, as honestly as possible. Uh, because your performance gives us grave concern, really, about the narrative that you've provided today on many of my questions today, including when there's clear evidence to the contrary. You've suggested that what we've been told, what the evidence suggests just isn't true. Uh, something has to be true, and I'm not sure what that is. Um, so I, I wish you the best in resolving this dispute. I hope that you take our concerns and questions seriously. Um, and if this dispute and the, these issues are not resolved in a timely fashion, we may have to call you back to ask for further questions and updates. Thank you, Mr. Thompson.